We're just a few days away from the election, less than a week away from November 8th and Election Day. And joining us now to talk about all the latest updates in the news leading up to this election and all those key races and down ballot as well is Dave Dulio, professor of political science at Oakland University, where he also serves as the director for its Center for Civic Engagement. Dave, thanks for being with us again. Hey, good morning, Tyler. Morning to you as well. It's uh, It's been an interesting week uh, of news since we had you on last time. A lot of updates, and in particular, uh, I think the biggest one is in the race for attorney general, where we are really seeing a narrowing gap between Dana Nessel and GOP challenger Matthew DiPerno. The last time we, we talked, we, we had spoken about you know, that margin being closer than it had ever been before, but still ver being in favor of Dana Nessel. And part of the issue with Matthew DiPerno's campaign has been a lack of name recognition behind him, even within his own party. Now we're seeing in a, in a recent Detroit news poll that was partnered with WDIV TV in Detroit or Channel 4 uh, that polled about 600 general election voters. That's got a dead heat there between Dana Nessel and Matthew DiPerno with Nessel, the incumbent, up just by uh, one percentage point uh, over Matthew DiPerno and well within the margin of error. What do you believe is... Uh, is the, the biggest factor, the biggest factors behind DiPerno being able to narrow this gap, especially so late in the election cycle? Yeah, you know, I, Tyler, I think it's two things. One is, uh, and, and we see this in other races as well, as they get closer, the, the Republicans are coming home and they are sort of galvanizing around their candidates. They are uh, folks who may have been uh, unsure of of the Republican general election candidates uh, even a month ago, but are now uh, making their decisions and saying, okay, I am going to vote for Matt DiPerno as a Republican. And the other thing, you know, I, that I think is happening is, uh, you know, I, frankly, I think that this, the, the tightening here says more about Dana Nessel than it does Matt DiPerno, right? Matt DiPerno has not done much to bring voters his way. And, and that's not a, a knock on him. That's just a, a fact of uh, campaign spending, right? That he just doesn't have the money to, to message and communicate with voters the way that Dana Nessel does or even other Republican candidates. But, you know, Nessel's, well, I'll put it this way. Re other Republican groups have done a good job of pointing out some negative things about Dana Nessel, whether it's uh, the um, the drag queen in every school, a comment that she made from a, a month or so ago, a couple months ago, uh, or other things, right? I mean, I think that uh, uh, it's more about her unpopularity than it is about DePerno's popularity. Yeah, Nestle certainly not uh, one to shy away from letting their sense of humor out, and uh, and in an election that's this serious <clears throat> and with, and with this much vitriol from both sides of the aisle. Now that can definitely be a negative, and that's one of the reasons I do agree with you why we're seeing Dana Nessel's margin of, of lead over Matthew DiPerno shrinking now to just 1%. And I think the, the best piece of evidence to that mostly being a referendum on these two candidates in particular, or, and mostly on the incumbent Nessel, is the, the polling numbers in the other key races at the top of the ballot here in Michigan with uh, Christina Caramo, the, the GOP challenger in the Secretary of State's race down uh, about 10 percentage points on Jocelyn Benson in that same Detroit News and WDIV-TV uh, poll. And then at the uh, gubernatorial le level, that same poll has Governor Whitmer up about 8.6% over Tudor Dixon at this time. So still, you know, close races, but nowhere near as close as that race between Dana Nessel and Republican challenger Matthew DiPerno for attorney general. Also making headlines this week, in the Secretary of State's race, Christina Caramo making some big waves in the largest population center in the, in the state of Michigan in, in Detroit as she had a filed a lawsuit seeking a court order that would reject thousands of absentee ballots in the city of Detroit. And essentially her hope would be to have Detroit voters need to have their votes counted only from in-person voting. How does this affect her chances here in the state of Michigan, in particular because Detroit's historically been a Democratic voting city. I don't think that something like this would be very consequential in, in helping Christina Caramo win many more votes in the city of Detroit, but it certainly is gonna have an impact because it continues on, along those same lines that we saw post the 2020 election where with concerns of election fraud from uh, the GOP, particularly in the city. 
Yeah, I, I don't think she has. She's not going to win. Uh, I, I don't think that that's even a, a consideration. I, I think that um, you what you see in the DiPerno Nestle race, you don't see in this in this Caramo Benson race. Republicans are galvanizing around their candidate. That's why she's down 10 points um, and or more, right? I mean, <clears throat> and Jocelyn Benson doesn't have the negatives uh, that that uh, Dana Nessel does. I think, you know, Republicans can point to the, the decision that Benson made in 2020 to send out voter uh, or absentee ballot applications to all voters in Michigan and point at that as something they don't like. But um, it, it's, it doesn't compare to uh, the, the negatives that, that Nestle has. And, I, and, and Christina Caramo just hasn't helped herself uh, in, in any way. Uh, that lawsuit's going nowhere. Um, and, and I think that it just is going to, it might be just the nail in the coffin. Yeah, it's kind of how I saw it too, because it, it's questionable this late in the game to come out with that lawsuit. It's questionable at any point uh, in, in the campaign to come out with that. It, uh, I mean, maybe it's a last ditch attempt to bring in more voters on the on the right. But I would think in that case that if she's going for those voters, those that would be favorable to something like this are already favorable to a campaign like her. So a questionable move uh, from Christina Caramo in, in that right. race. And, and, she, and I again, think it she's just, down it, 10%. It, it just seems like it's a um, an attention getting move, right? Where, you know, it, 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 with, with no other um, attention, uh, no other earned media, no other paid media, you know, she's trying to, to get some attention. And, you know, I, I just, I'd be curious to, to have been in those meetings uh, deciding to file that lawsuit, right? Because uh, absentee ballots, uh, vote by mail in that regard are is is a constitutional guarantee in Michigan. So I uh, I don't get it, but I, you know, I'm I'm not a lawyer, um but uh, I I don't think that's going anywhere. We're joined by Dave Julio from Oakland University on today's edition of the Megacast. He is a professor of political science and the director of their Center for Civic Engagement uh, in the gubernatorial battle uh, that same poll from the Detroit News and Local 4 in Detroit has Governor Whitmer leading Republican challenger Tudor Dixon uh, with Whitmer having currently in that poll 51.7% of the state's support uh, compared to Dixon's 43.1%. Uh, we saw in, in the last debate, when we've already talked about the impact that the last debate had immediately on those two campaigns and what we saw in that last really public uh, outlook from both of these candidates toward the other campaign. In, in the last six days or so before the election and leading up to election day itself. What does Tudor Dixon have to do? Or what do you believe is going to be her strategy in these final days before the election to try to bridge that gap? Still very much doable, but you know, still you know, even within the you know, within the, the smaller margin that it is compared to the Caramo and Benson race, and uh, and slightly larger than it is, of course, the, the Nestle de Perno race. It's still very much in Whitmer's favor. Yeah, you know, I, I would also point out too that there's there's other polling out there that's got it tied. And, and I think that, you know, that gets to, and, and that's done by a, a, a group called the Trafalgar Group. Um, right. They are a, uh, they're a, they're a GOP firm, but they have had a really good track record in the last couple of cycles, especially at the state level of, um, of getting their last pre-election poll correct. Uh, so I think that that's something to look at. I'm not saying that, that the race is tied. I'm not saying that, um, that, that uh, Mrs. Dixon's gonna win. Uh, but I think that it's, you know, it's probably somewhere between Tide and and uh, Whitmer up nine. I think if the election were held today, she she would win, but it's not held today. They've got another uh, six days to campaign for all those uh, in-person uh, votes. And, you know, and, and the other thing, and, and maybe we can come back to this, right, is the the absentee votes that are, that are still out there. But in terms of what uh, Dixon needs to do and what she's going to do. I think she's going to continue to hammer away on a couple of issues, the economy, as well as um, uh, the uh, response of uh, the Whitmer administration to uh, COVID in schools. Uh, I think that that was the, the memorable moment or one of the memorable moments for me was, was in the debate when um, Gretchen Whitmer said that kids were out of school for three months. And and uh, you know, I think we talked about that last week. The, but parents, they have a different, uh, different memory, uh, and it maybe is true that 
you know, that, that uh, only the, the governor's order applied to a three month uh, shutdown of schools, but kids were out for a lot longer than that. I think that uh, the Republicans are gonna use that as a, as a hammer and keep hitting uh, the governor with it. We've seen both of these campaigns continue to get out on the road across the state of Michigan and bring in uh, some of their political friends from uh, all across the country in order to make that final push. Governor Whitmer recently uh, having an appearance in the city of Detroit and, uh, with uh, President Barack, former President Barack Obama and then uh, Tudor Dixon also touring the state with a variety of different Republicans that have come in to join her on her campaign in these final days. Uh, in the middle of the ballot, we've seen, we're continuing to see a very intense battle for some of these House of Representatives and, and Senate uh, and Senate battles at the state level and uh, House of Representatives battles at the federal level. And, and there's just a report in the Detroit Free Press this week. Uh, uh, this week, it's really interesting looking at the most expensive political campaigns in the entire country. And tied for number one is that battle for the seventh con congressional district in Mid Michigan between Tom Barrett and Alyssa Slotkin, and tied with the uh, Nevada third district at $27 million as we are approaching. And that's just a ridiculous amount for any campaign. But as we're, as we're approaching the final days of the election, just how close is that gap and how indicative with that amount of money is it to just how close of a race there is between Slotkin and Barrett? Yeah, whenever you see uh, the, that kind of spending uh, from both sides, right? That, that yeah. uh, those out outside groups on the, on the left and the right uh, look at it as one that they are are that they can win, and and one that they they desperately want to win. And you know, on the on the Democratic side, it's to it's to keep an incumbent, it's to keep a sitting office holder, uh, and on the on the Republican side, it's to it's to uh, pick off one of those, right, and to to uh, um, flip a seat. So you, you've got uh, uh, well, you, you've said it right in the the twenty some million dollars that were. Uh, that have been spent so far and there's going to be more in the last week because it's close and it, you know every little bit um might be able to help every uh every every ad that gets aired might turn one voter and that by that might be enough we're joined by dave dulio from oakland university their director for the center of civic engagement as well as a professor of political science to, uh, th this year's midterm election november 8th is election day coming up less than a week away and still plenty to happen in between now and then that will certainly have a big impact on the results on that day or upwards of 24 hours as it has been reported earlier on in the week from the secretary of state's office for those results dave anything else that we should be keeping an eye on as we're getting very close to election day well as i mentioned right the, there's there's still a lot of absentee ballots that are that remain out um i think that's an interest and and What's more interesting is the, uh, the, the the notice from the Secretary of State to, to those folks not to use the mail. Yeah. And and I get it, right, that, that there might be delays in the, from the Postal Service. Uh, the Secretary of State's office is quick to point out that we have not seen those yet, but they're still encouraging folks to take those absentee ballots and, and drop them off. Um, because they don't want to have any, uh, um, any any undue delays, right? Or have a chance that somebody's uh, absentee ballot doesn't get counted. But that's an extra step, right? That That's not supposed to be part of the absentee ballot process. People get absentees because they want to be able to do it at home and mail it back. So it'll be interesting to see how many of those outstanding absentees actually get turned in. Uh, I would also say that that the Secretary of State's office and, and clerks around the state are getting out in front of uh, potential delays in in results where the, the absentees aren't going to get counted until the day of. That's a lot of ballots to count. Uh, and it might be a scenario that we saw last time around where uh, election night results change as absentee ballots come in because, frankly, Democrats vote more absentee than Republicans. and. You know, you could you could be in a situation where you see Republicans lead uh, when you go to bed on election night, and then the next day the Democrats have 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 uh, taken the lead in some of those races, and that's only going to fuel the uh, the the doubts about the election integrity. It's it's going to be a, a similar scenario as last time, and and I and I'm not sure what we can do about it um, except be transparent.
with, with uh, more information can be found and, and resources leading up to the election at oakland.edu slash cce dave thanks for being with us today thanks for having me